all will be thrown down. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Well, if you were a Jew growing up in the time of Jesus, the second temple in Jerusalem would have been the most impressive building you had ever seen. Spread across 36 acres of land with walls 20 stories high, covered in gold and in jewels. It looked a little bit like uh, this, right? But the second temple was more than a beautiful building. It was also a symbol. Built after the Jews returned from exile in Babylon, this, the temple was for them a symbol of hope and, and, and identity. It was a symbol of stability and safety. Living under the shadow of the Roman Empire, the temple was something they could call theirs. It was their center. It was the center of not only their religious life, but also their political life and their communal life. The second temple was like the White House and the Capitol building and the National Cathedral all combined into one. And so now we can begin to grasp why when Jesus and the disciples are walking out of the temple this morning, one of the disciples turns around and says, teacher, look, what large stones and large buildings. And we can also begin to feel the shock of what comes next when Jesus turns around and says, I see it. Do you see these great buildings and do you see these walls that make you feel safe and secure? Not one stone will be left upon another and all will be thrown down. And that is exactly what happened. In August of AD 70, when the Romans sieged the city of Jerusalem and set fire to the temple and burned down the temple and the entire city. Which raises the question for us this morning, how do we go on in the moments when it feels like our world has collapsed? How do we endure whether it's in our work life, or our family life, or our political life, what do we do when the walls that once made us feel safe and secure begin to fall? And this morning, here's what our gospel tells us. Nothing lasts except Christ's body. Hang on. Nothing lasts except Christ's body. Hang on. First, nothing lasts. And we see this again when Christ says, all will be thrown down. And I was reminded of this yesterday when I was writing this sermon. When I had come almost to the end of the sermon, had written almost the whole thing, but I made the perilous mistake of forgetting to save it. And so then I went out on a run, and our six-year-old son found my laptop, and he, and he uh, X'd out of the sermon, and then it said, do you want to save before exiting? And he said, no. And so the sermon was gone. And it's hard to believe, but there will come a day when everything will be gone, when there will be no Ascension Chapel, when there will be no Church of the Incarnation or Diocese of Dallas. There will come a day when there will be no United States of America, and that includes, yes, even the state of Texas. There will be a day when all the wealth you've accumulated when all the Bitcoin you bought in 2018 will pass on to someone else. There will be a day when you will not be able to work anymore, when each of our bodies will become disabled, whether mentally or physically. What is the thing that you think is most unshakable for Peter and James and John and Andrew the answer was easy. It was the temple. But if the temple can fall, then anything can fall. Which for us is either really concerning or really comforting, depending on who we are. Because if you walk into these walls this morning and your life feels put together and you are in control and everything is as it's supposed to be, 
It's terrifying. But if you come here this morning and the walls of your life have already fallen and you are not in control, it's comforting to know that you are not alone, that all will be thrown down and nothing will last except Christ's body. And we see this at the beginning of the passage when Jesus leads the disciples out of the temple and they go down into a valley and then they go back up onto the Mount of Olives. And so here they are on one mountain staring at the temple on another mountain. And so what Jesus has done is he has created this critical distance between himself over here and everything over there, between everything that will fall and him. It's like the Skeeter Davis song from the 60s, End of the World. Do you know this song? She wakes up one morning, the morning after her lover has walked out on her, and this is what she says. Why do the birds go on singing? And why do the stars glow above? Don't they know it's the end of the world? It ended when I lost your love. And what Jesus is saying to us this morning is that if you give your heart to anything that is temporary, when it falls, you will fall too. And it will feel like the end of the world. But if you give your heart to me, and you remain with me over here, even if everything falls around you, you can never be fully crushed. Why? Because Christ is the temple that has already fallen. He is the new temple, the body in whom God dwelled fully, and he was crushed. On the cross, not one stone was left upon another, His body was broken and all was thrown down. But unlike the second temple, and unlike everything else in this life, he rose, never to fall again. And if you have been joined to him by faith and by baptism, you are his body too, and you will never fall again either. And this is why we come to church. And this is why we celebrate the Eucharist every week, because in doing so, we, as Christ's body, eat of Christ's body, remembering that we and him will never die. I mean, all throughout our week, Monday through Saturday, we become so impressed with everything we've built and accomplished in our life, We gaze up at whatever it is we find impressive and we say, what large stones and large buildings? But then we come here and we're reminded of what lasts and what doesn't. Third, hang on. Nothing lasts except my body, hang on. And we see this in the final verse this morning where Christ says, all of this is the beginning of the birth pangs. Now, as a man, I'm not going to try to flesh out this metaphor for you and tell you what it feels like to be in labor. Uh, I felt like it would be was safer for me to just ask my wife what it's like. And so was, here's what she told me. She said, quote, being in labor was the most painful and exhausting thing I've ever done. When I, when I was having our first child, Sam, I was in labor for 20 hours but I could picture the baby. I knew I was having a boy, and I could picture the boy, and so it was all worth it, and I would do it again. So by describing suffering and catastrophe and the end of the world using the language of labor, Jesus is reminding us of two things. First, any suffering we face in this life is momentary. And second, it is always bringing forth something new. So when our worlds fall apart, it is not because God likes tearing things down, but it is because he is building a new world. And so friends, 
the moment it feels like your life is over, it isn't. Losing someone you love, getting a horrific diagnosis, getting laid off, being rejected or left out by your friend group, not making the team, being abandoned by the one that you love, these are the birth pangs, and they are utterly painful, but they are not the end, and through them, God is always birthing something new, and so hang on. This past week, I read a post from a famous com columnist entitled, Don't Panic in which he was addressing our tendency, especially since COVID, to claim that we are living in unprecedented times. Whether for geopolitical reasons or environmental reasons or because of AI, it is increasingly common to hear this claim that we are living in the worst time in human history. But are we? I mean, really? Of all the times and all the people, it, it's us? I mean, the, the columnist writes, there's a certain narcissism in thinking that you live in the worst of times. In general, it's important to always remember the hard times never end, but because they never end, they aren't really hard times, they're just times, and it's all just life. And he's right. Friends, this morning, we read passages like this and we want to know when it is that Jesus is describing. And Jesus isn't just describing events that happened in the past in AD 70, and he isn't just describing events that will happen in some future date we don't know. And he isn't just describing life in November of 2024, but he's describing our life as it is always because we are never in control. And our life is always being interrupted or shaken up or turned upside down. The times are always hard, but by the grace of God, they're always good too. It's like the end of the Lord of the Rings. Sam and Frodo are on Mount Doom they're surrounded by fire and evil and darkness. And so naturally, Sam turns to Frodo and begins talking about strawberries. Do you remember this? He says, do you remember the Shire, Mr. Frodo? It'll be spring soon, and the orchards will be in blossom, and the birds will be nesting in the hazel thicket and they will be sowing the summer barley in the lower fields and eating the first of the strawberries with cream. Do you remember the taste of strawberries? Friends, even at the end of the world, when it feels like our lives are over, there are strawberries and there are birds and there's wine and music and friends and jobs to do, and spouses to love, and children to delight in. Nothing lasts except Christ's body, so hang on and enjoy. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.